You're listening to the CBS show on Phonic FM 106.8, bringing news from the voluntary and community centre in Exeter. Exeter CBS runs the local volunteer centre, offers affordable learning in IT, management and personal development, and gives membership support to charities and community groups across the city. Visit www.exetercvs.org.uk or call 01392 2020 double five to find out more. Local sound alternative 24 hours a day. Phonic FM on 106.8 FM. Phonic FM CVS show Thursday afternoon. Yes, we are here. We've been introing you with some musical tracks while we gather our thoughts here in the studio. I'm joined by the Words Community Writing Group and I've got Liz, Mary and Barbie in the studio with me. Hello. Hello. Hi, hi. Um, we've got, is it three stories and a flash fiction? Yes. Excellent. And what are the themes that you've been exploring recently? Because you've moved sites now where you, where you gather and, and do your work. Yeah, you... we have actually, John. We're now down at St Thomas Library in Exeter. Mm-hmm. Uh, every second Saturday, starting September the 10th, uh, between 10 and 12 in the morning. Very nice venue, very nice people down there. And we are um, inexpensive because it's on um, uh, charity status. Oh, that's and, brilliant. Yeah. Yes, it's great, isn't and it? And so it's a very small amount of money per week, depending how many is in the group. Maximum of 10. Yeah. Um, because other than that, there's too much to get in under that. Okay. Uh, over that. And um, uh, so really, it can, it can be a very little amount for six weeks. It can be as little as six pounds seven pounds something like that that's brilliant isn't it yeah yeah and we will be having um a sort of a christmas evening there with everybody reading and uh, the friends of the library supply tea and we'll have mince pies and can wine. i come to that you most certainly can i hope you behave you yourself you can yeah yes. I well i don't know <laughs> oh, you don't want to live with you yeah, it's festive come december <laughs> oh dear um, yeah, that sounds brilliant. Mm. So you're recruiting as well at the moment, then, really. So you, you've well, got—I know you've got a few new members. Yes, we have. Uh, we did actually get up to nine with uh, somebody, but they had to come from Hon- Honiton, and they had um, a pat dog, which she takes around to nursing homes. Oh, and unfortunately, yeah. dogs, unless they're guy dogs, were not allowed in the library. Okay. So, so this is probably a really well-behaved one, but the rule is exactly, the rule. Exactly, because it. Other people would then say it's not fair. Yeah. So I think we're, we, we are sort of about eight people at the moment, hmm. uh, which good. is very nice. Yes, hmm. it is eight. And we're doing it? an anthology. We're getting our anthology together. Okay, so yes. with the idea of self-publishing. No, no, just basically um, to perhaps who knows in the future on um, an e-book, hmm. but at the moment just to. Uh, have between friends and publicise the group, Barbie as yes, well. Yes, yeah. publicise the group. Because that could be put together as an ebook, and then we, it could be circulated around. And it could be, yes. Hmm? Yeah. So we will shall give copies of that to the chosen few. Yes, <laughs> that sounds rather good. Yeah. The chosen few. Are we going to kick off with a story? Yes, I think um, perhaps interestingly, should we start with Mary's flash fiction? Yes. And maybe okay. we could explain a little about the uh, flash fiction. That's a really good idea, actually. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So this, Mary, would you like to explain about your story and and the extra um, writers? Yes. Okay, Barbie. Well, John, um, my, the title of my flash fiction piece that was submitted uh, for the extra flash fiction competition in two thousand and fifteen is called Beggar, and um, this was a subject we were given as. Um, as part of our writing group it's an exercise not to do a piece of flash fiction but uh, I eventually managed to cut down what I had done to the requisite uh, 250 words and I have to say that uh, I wasn't going to submit this um, but people she said looking over and giving Barbie the evil eye um, (laughs) just went on and said you must do this and um so I'm not very confident in many ways about my writing so uh, I, I bunged it in and um much to my surprise it was long listed in last year's competition so that Fantastic. meant I got down to the last 25 which was amazing so it's um 250 words and it, it is about something I experienced when I was in India some years ago okay so here we go this is beggar The tuk-tuk came to an abrupt halt near Old Delhi Junction. A cow stood in the middle of the road. 
My driver wiped his face and cursed in Hindi. To me, he said, I stop here. It was furnace hot. There was an hour before the Kalka train left. I watched people scurrying from the station like so many ants. Spices piled high on stalls, orange, yellow, vermilion, vibrant saris, smells of a food cooking, the cries of street traders, the stench of drains and ordure. My senses were assailed by all of India. Inside the station, the heat became intolerable, the press of people overwhelming. A chai waller picked a tortuous route through the crowd, shouting, Chai! Garam Chai! Behind him, a woman pushed and jostled. Something was tied to her back. As she drew nearer, I saw it was a boy. His head lolled and his tongue protruded. He had no hands. She was shaking a beggar's cup and saying a word, Bhopal. She drew abreast of me, muttering, Bhopal, Bhopal, as she pointed to the child. I gave her some coins. She smiled and her worn face became beautiful. Suddenly a policeman appeared wielding a truncheon. He grabbed her roughly and hit her. The money spilled on the ground. The woman looked back as she was hauled away, her eyes pleading. The welt on her cheek was livid. She still cried out, Bhopal, Bhopal, her mantra of misery. Oh, wow. That's Excellent. powerful. Mm. That is. And that's, the, that's something you actually experienced when you were in India. Yes, yes, yes. But it was mm. beautifully written. A beautifully written. And you could smell it, oh, see I was it. there. You mm. could smell it. I, I love the use of the word ordure as well. You don't yeah. hear that very often. But it kind of gives you that impression of things piled up of all different sorts that are all the rubbish. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, that's brilliant, Mary. Thank you. And also to cut it down the story... To make it 250 words, I think Mary was having apoplexy <laughs> doing that. It I is bet. not easy. But that's the hardest thing, bit. It's not a case of just taking out the odd no. and that's too many no, or, no, no, no. A, mm. or an if or a the. Mm. or the, It's mm. not. You start then to think, oh no, if I do that, I can't say that. So that means a whole new sentence, which then means, in actual fact, you virtually end up rewriting yes and it's a big yes. job isn't it Mary it's a, hu- it's a huge job and, and and difficult to do when you're trying not to lose the essence yes. of what you've originally yeah. written because I think that was about 500 words yes, wasn't it, it was, originally it so I've had to almost and in actual fact it's it. it's more powerful Cut in down. a way as yes. 250 yes. words it's it interesting is. Mm. it's like it's almost making it more like a poem and, mm. and it's like sensory impressions mm. coming in waves at you with each sentence, yeah. isn't it? That's what you, what you get. It's with it. really. I thought it was excellent. It's really excellent. Yeah. I'd like Mary to have been shortlisted on mm. that one. It's a lot of people were going for that competition, weren't they? So to get longlisted is like pretty well, amazing. I was, I was amazed actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was absolutely <laughs> thrilled to bits, you know, because mm. it's. Excellent. Just for when that. you submitted it, did you have to say what it was about and, and the no. fact that it was real? No, no, you didn't. No, you just submitted. Yeah, and just that's just yeah, it. Yeah, that was it. Mm. Two hundred and fifty words on any subject you chose, really. Yeah. But um, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, excellent, wasn't it? Excellent yes. that one, John. Yes, yeah, so that's going to become part of the the anthology. Oh, yes. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. Mm. We so are we trying to pick out the best with everyone's opinion on. Which is nice because everything we do on a critique is from a really helpful oh, yes, kind of place. Hmm. Say, don't, it's not your best. Don't like that, or could you change? And it's it's really useful for us all to do that, isn't it, Mayor, um, Liz? As well. Hmm. So, yeah. So yeah. So it's friendly. So if anyone is nervous about writing but wants mm-hmm. to do it, then this is mm-hmm. the place to come. Then isn't it? There's no mm-hmm. sort of harsh critique, judgment. No, it's, it's absolutely not. Well, no. And if they don't want it. They just say, I'm not ready. Not ready to receive this. Or mm. they might just pick out one, do you think I perhaps started that right? And you might say, well, you mm. perhaps could have brought the first, the second paragraph as your first paragraph, which is often the case. You often do that. Mm. Right, yes. You do that. Yes. Or, or little things, but if you don't say, I'm not ready for critique, uh, yeah. leave it out. And you learn by listening. Mm. And you go home and you think, oh, golly, yes, I see what she did. I'm going to have a go at that. And honestly, within... Within a year, which isn't a year of Saturdays, that no. that person's writing will have improved mm. tremendously. Mm. Mm. I have heard that, yeah, that, that people who do some kind of writing course 
they really notice how much their writing improves leaps and bounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a friend of mine who has written he's just about to write his third book he did at the Open University creative writing course mm -hmm. right. he said it was the best course he has ever I done bet. yeah I bet I feel guilty that I've never done it but uh, mm. just can't seem to quite you know you need you need a free head you do, to, to actually yeah. sit down and yes. do it and not have any distractions around you because it's impossible mm. So, so, moving something from a short story into flash fiction, is that a, an exercise itself? Is that something you would try and do with people? No. Is, or is it a whole different genre? It is. It I think is it is entirely different, isn't mm. it? I think if you're right, if Mary was told at the beginning or asked at the beginning that we were doing a flash fiction, I wonder if she would have done that. She might not have done. Mm. No. But to, you, to actually press a, a story to flash, very, very difficult. Mm. You could perhaps just give a as though you're just doing a review like a book review a very yes. quick yes. thing and then try to make a story but I think it's easier to start off with a, a flesh a fresh a, excuse me a fresh piece piece of flash fiction and um, with a, a often with a middle beginning and an end but not necessary hmm. you know yes. it can just be because it can be impressionistic can't yes, it yes yeah. and it can be mm -hmm. that vignette can't it as yours yes. is yes mm -hmm. yes but the there's so many characters and so much in that you'd never believe that that was 250 words, would you? No, you wouldn't know. Because no. I've kind of filled in backstories for people as, you know, the characters in yeah. there. I'm wondering with the, with the little boy's hand whether that oh. was a deliberate thing. Yes, I, I, who yeah. knows? Um, and obviously you think, well, it, it probably wasn't here. That's his mother, so it wouldn't have been her, but it would have been someone who mm. did that. And but he was born that way because, I mean, that, that, because of the Bhopal the Union Carbide explosion and stuff that happened years ago. Oh, right, I didn't know what that uh, was. No. Yeah. And, and that, that happened at Bhopal in India. Yeah. And um, so subsequently, children were born deformed, were born deformed over, over oh, generations. Right. Okay. It was a, a generational thing, John. It wasn't, I want to say, just the, the sort of uh, women who were pregnant at the time of, of this disaster who produced children with malformations... Um, it went through generations, generations. Oh, right. Yeah. Dreadful, dreadful. Dreadful. Yeah, and uh, is, I, yeah. I don't know whether they ever, in the end, ever got their sixpence each mm. from the big gas carbine company, wasn't it, or something yes. like that, Mary? Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Union Carbide, Union, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah right. no, I don't know. It was still an ongoing... I read something in the paper a few... Yeah. Maybe a year or so ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, when the case was still... Yeah being argued yes mm. you know how could they argue it the greed it's greed John it's, it's so scary awful. isn't it mm. yeah, it's, mm. it's really scary yeah, mm. yeah. That, that people can be born like that yes so unfair mm. Mm. it's dreadful yeah, for, for profit for profit yeah, yeah. Mm. but that's yeah it's a lovely story though it's fantastic mm. shall we have a song and then come back with some, yes. some more stories The CBS Show on Phonic FM Find out more about community and voluntary work in Exeter at www.exetercbs.org.uk. Visit us weekdays, 9.30 to 4.30 on King William Street or call 01392 2020 55. Drama, spoken word and great music. Phonic FM 106.8. And we've got all three actually in one show, which is pretty good, isn't it? That's why I found that jingle. <laughs> <laughs> We've been having a really interesting chat while the music was on about how everybody has a different way of writing. And, and Liz, you were saying you, you're a planner, so you, yeah. you actually have, have got it all, the, the ending, the middle, everything. Well, I write from beginning to end in sort of short paragraphs, the mm -hmm. idea of the story. I, mean, I don't know how it's going to end when I start, but then I have to fill it out put all the detail all the scenes in yeah so I've got the main structure and mm. then I have to fill in all the scenes at the moment I'm writing conversations to go into scenes mm. so I do it like that okay yeah. so you're kind of like sort of doing a broad, broad strokes and filling in the details afterwards yeah, yeah. yeah. so what about yourself Mary have you got a pattern to it mm, not really I'm pretty <laughs> haphazard if I'm honest um, when I, I I tend to write about things I've seen or I've experienced myself. I'm, I'm not someone who um, is a fabulist in any way. You know, mm. I, I, I write about actual 
things that I've experienced um, and I don't plan anything hmm. okay that's interesting and Barbara you say you the muse takes, takes you doesn't she yeah, yeah I just have a basic idea sit down and perhaps get the first line in and then just let whatever happens happen hmm. I don't know what I'm going to write about the it's next day or the next sentence um, it's most peculiar it's yeah. as though somebody is writing it for me that's interesting yes yeah, it? m- most odd yeah um, so I never panic once I feel happy I'll know mm. at the very beginning whether or not yeah. anything is going to take off mm. I just you know I will now I have started to think about it more but I still let it sort of just happen mm. because I find that the story leads me through to the ending yes Mm. somehow okay yeah so mm. it's almost like it's it, it it's like the idea of the marble waiting for the statue to be unleashed yes, from it yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. you could well, maybe i'm just sculpting the words who sculpting knows the words, yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of songwriters say that the songs just come yeah dylan and especially yeah. he, he would say yes. that he just sat there and waited for them to come yeah. and when yeah. he had a dry period he didn't know what to do no no it's mm. terrible it happens yeah. to all of us doesn't it when you th- and actually you get quite depressed Hmm. Or let's say not really depressed, that's a big word, but you do get quite fed up and miserable when you think, oh, I can't think of anything, I can't get this together. I think it's because you, it's, you're being told, don't bother. Yes. Yeah. This one's sure not, right. not going right. to work. Yeah. Just write yeah. something else. Just yeah. because we have a word, mm. if the word isn't happening for you, you know, for the writing group or mm. the idea, don't bother. Just write mm. what you want to write because it's best to write something than nothing. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. you, but if you mm. don't get your backside on a seat yeah. with a pen or your computer, you're not going to write anything anyway. No, so you've got to put that side of it oh, in that, that, yes. that yeah. in That is the main dedication. Yeah. It's sitting down. It couldn't be easier, could it? Because mm. once you're sitting down with that paper and pen or computer and think, I have got to stay here for half an hour, once you start into it, you look at your watch and you think, oh, my God, it's two hours later. Mm. And then mm. you start, you realise you've enjoyed it. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. I think Isn't that's it? absolutely right. It's meant to be yeah. enjoyable. So it's hard work sometimes, but it's yeah. meant to be enjoyable. Yes, yes. well, exactly. Yes. And it must be because we all trudge in every other Saturday, <laughs> yes. come rain or shine, me <laughs> having the longest trudge from <laughs> Clumpton, yes. Liz having the shortest, seeing she lives next door to the library. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, <laughs> so something gets, gets us all motivated. Yes, yeah. It's good. It's mm. a natural human thing to be creative, I think. Isn't it? I'm sure it is, yeah. 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 So, wh- where are we going next? Okay, well, I'll do the next one then. This is called um, To Be Worshipped Again. The island of Anthrithodos stretched out her arm into the mist-covered sea. In the distance, you could hear the shouts of the fishermen and the gentle slap of their oars hitting the water. The Queen had spent the night with Marcus, and her absence from the royal palace left a strange, haunting silence of foreboding. I stood straight and tall, fighting to ignore signs I could not explain. And if it were possible, how could I say? I watched the servants as they busied themselves in the temple, scattering scented flowers over the royal walkway. Above them, the marble dawn chiselled paths of light in readiness for the sun god's chariot. I listened to their gossip and sniggering whispers. They said the queen was angry because Marcus had been up all night drinking and this morning had to be carried to the baths, vomiting all the way. But as the royal barge slid up to the landing jetty, I could see that he was beside her, bathed, fresh, ready for the ceremony. The water lapped against the sides of the granite slabs as the mariners secured the ropes to the large bronze rings. Then from the covered canopy she appeared, royal and radiant, in a simple garment of white transparent pleated linen. On her head she wore not the throne emblem of the goddess Isis, but a simple gold diadem that rested on her lush black hair. The bloom of her youth was fading, but her presence gave a sense of awe to all who saw her. Turning towards Marcus with an outstretched hand, she beckoned him, this former leader of Rome, who even with his battle scars was handsome, and he obeyed like an obedient child. You could see the searing ambition that shone from his eyes as he looked at the queen, our daughter queen, who lay Egypt at his feet. 
Alexander of Macedon had founded our city, which was great before mighty Rome was clad in marble. Its harbour and docks bustled with trade, while the night arrivals could see their way from the towering lighthouse on Pharos that guided them safely into Alexandria. Who would have thought that things could ever change? Together they entered the temple courtyard, the high priestess and her Roman. I saw the way she looked at him with her coal-painted eyes, and clearly how she loved him. The Roman people adored him too, saying that she had bewitched him body and soul with her magic. Whether she did or not, we can never know, for love in itself is magic of sorts. Whatever the truth, he abandoned everything for her, this Greek queen of Egypt. He walked behind her as she ascended the temple steps, followed by the shaven-headed priest, whose chosen celibacy to the mother goddess was their greatest gift. Oh, to return there, to listen to the sistrums moving to the hymn of Isis, with music from the trimbles and drums echoing around the columns of the towering temple, as the devotees threw sweet-smelling petals into the air, creating a perfumed carpet for the worshippers who followed them. Then all was silent as we waited for the sun god to rise from his burning bed on the horizon, casting his glorious light through the temple as the goddess, assisted by her high priestess, Cleopatra, waited to be reborn. With the passage of time, changes happen, it is expected, but they all thought that Cleopatra, last of the Ptolemies, was different. So when we were told that she had given her final embrace to an asp, we grieved. Mark Antony was spared this, for he let the sharp blade of his fighting sword release his life's blood rather than be taken back to Rome in Octavian's triumph and a traitor's death. What fools they were to think they could conquer Rome and rule the empire. I wept for them in their blindness, for now not even the protection of the goddess could help them as they waited in her dark sanctuary on the beautiful island of Anthyridos. Many suns and moons have crossed the heavens since that day, and time let us be ruled by many other gods. Was it this which made Poseidon the thunderer shoot his anger through Alexandria, pulling all to the ground, sparing nothing as the screams of fear filled the air? On the island, the royal palace, Antony's quarters, and the jetties where boats still attached to the same bronze rings as the royal barge so many years ago, cracked and crumbled. Then a wave like I had never seen before roared above the temple, dragging everything to the bottom of the sea. I stood straight and tall for as long as I could, but no one can defy Poseidon. Perhaps the mother goddess had pity on me as I drifted to the seabed. Perhaps she knew my future fate and that in time I would have a story to tell. I was not uncomfortable. The sand was soft and the sun still shone heating the salty sea. But the silence, the unenduring silence, that I could not bear. I longed to hear music, the gossip in the temple courtyard and to be rid of the scaly fish that now swam over me. Then one day a fish I had never seen before, long, black, with big feet that blew bubbles from its head, swam over me and stared into my face. Suddenly there were more of them. They bound my body with ropes and nets, until slowly I started to float and sway upwards, nearer and nearer towards the blue sky. I saw men's faces, women's too, as I was lowered onto a strange boat. The first thing I did was to look at the city, but all was different. The skyline was rebuilt, the landscape changed beyond all my memories. The water from the ropes ran down my face. Someone said, he looks as though he's crying. Me, crying, Ptolemy the Twelfth of Egypt, father of Cleopatra, high priestess of Isis, the last of our dynasty, the last Ptolemy crying. That's absolutely brilliant. That's an amazing <laughs> story, Barbie. I love oh, that. That is amazing. It's yeah. happened. You know, they, they found the statues. They, so that's. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. It's just. Fa I mean, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, they found the palace, they found all the statues. Yeah. And him. 
When, you, when did this happen? Has this been the Oh, no, it was quite a few years ago. Not yeah. that many, not ten years ago. But well, it might be now. Things yeah. happen so quick. Oh, wow. You must, you must um, Google it. Yeah. Fascinating. Because they wondered where her palace was. And yes. uh, it was a French archaeologist, you know, marine archaeologist. Mm. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, that was lovely because I had no idea until uh, that certain point in the story where all, all the pennies started to drop. It was just that was yeah, lovely. Oh, good, lovely. Thank yeah. you. It's marvelous. <laughs> Mary made me read that one today. It's a lovely one to read it's out beautiful. loud. It's beautiful. The alliteration in it is just kind of it's very sensual, isn't it? Oh, good. That's it's a wonderful good, John. story. Oh, that's mm. good. We'll put that in the anthology, Lynn. Mm. Uh, Liz, not Lynn. Sorry. Yeah. Mary, we, I think we need to to. Um, Yes, we need to read have yours because you've got to head off. I've got to head off, yes. Okay. Okay, well, this uh, is called The Visit, and. Um, if we just go back in here to. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, this is called The Visit, and um, it was one of the tasks we were given as a group, you know, to write something on this title. And um, this, is, this is what I, what I did. Um, so, here we go. Late summer, the sky a faded blue, the sun warm on my face. Squinting in its glare, I shade my eyes and scan the landscape. It rolls out before me flat as far as the eye can see. It felt alien to me all those years ago when I first came to spend holidays with my grandparents and it feels alien to me now. Immediately in front of me, a patch of rough ground, home to bracken, cow parsley and scarlet poppies. Beyond is an area of cultivation, lush and green, bordered by a sandy path and a ragged hedgerow. I move my head slightly. To the left of my field of vision is the windmill. Its sails are motionless, the air heavy and sultry. The past, my past, depresses me. What foolish impulse has brought me back here after an absence of 40 years? Shame, anger, or a wish to confront? I pick my way through the bracken to reach the narrow road leading to the village. The rasp of my shoes on its surface is the only thing that breaks the silence. Drawing level with the windmill, I look up at its blind-eyed windows. The Hollins family had lived in the cottage behind it. Bert Hollins had been the chief of my childhood tormentors. Handsome-faced and broad-shouldered, and at fourteen a head taller than the other village lads. I was a year younger, slightly built and myopic, an unprepossessing specimen and a transient. He called me Runt. I moved on down the road, preoccupied with thoughts and memories. How surreal this is. The tarmac shimmers in the heat. Rounding a bend, I notice the wood's green denseness. The years are stripped away. Anxiety courses through me. My guts churn. I see the gate to the wood. It looks exactly the same, its gnarled surface worn smooth by the touch of countless hands. Pushing it open, I walk up the narrow track. In this place I am a boy again, fearful, an outsider, alone. The resinous smell of the pines hits me as I move tentatively forward into the half-light. Here, the trees are so crowded together that some trunks almost touch the trunk of their neighbour. The path is overgrown and difficult to see. I push my way through the briars until I reach the clearing and the pool. Today, it is peaceful here, but it was not always so. Closing my eyes, that summer evening comes back to me in all its starkness and terror. That holiday, the village boys had been less rejecting of me, had allowed me to join in more. I wanted to believe they were beginning to accept me or even like me a little, but it was a sham, as I was to find out. It happened at the end of August. The light was fading earlier each evening. We all used to gather in the field next to the wood. 
That day they were all there before me, Bert Hollins, Jack Hill, Jim Mason and Fred Brewer. With them were a couple of older lads who I didn't know. They were all smoking and laughing. They fell silent as I approached. Evening, said Bert. He turned to the new newcomers, jerking a thumb in my direction. This here's Runt. Runt, say hello to my cousins, Pete and Jerry. Everyone sniggered. Hello, I said, trying to sound confident. Hello, Runt, said Pete, the elder of the two. He extended his hand as if to shake mine, but instead yanked my arm so that I fell forward. Suddenly they were all on me, pinning me down. My glasses came off, and I heard the sound of them being crunched underfoot. Someone laughed. They hauled me upright. I cried out in protest. I was punched hard in my arm and on my back. I turned to look. It was Bert Hollins. Shut up, Runt! He bawled, kicking me in the shins. I was yelling now as hard as I could. Punches rained down on me as I was dragged by two of them along the path to the wood. At some point I must have lost consciousness because when I once again became aware of anything I was lying on my back. Without my glasses things were blurred but I could just make out their faces and I could hear the faint lap of water. We must be near the pool. One of them prodded me with the toe of his shoe. Get up, runt, he said. It was Pete. Before I could get my balance, they charged me and flung me bodily into the water. They knew I could not swim well. They stood on the bank, jeering and laughing as I floundered about. Suddenly, I felt something solid under my feet. It was the spur of ground that sloped into the pool at its far edge. The noise suddenly stopped. I peered into the gloom. I couldn't see anyone. I shuddered. Perhaps they were hiding, waiting to pounce again. I waited for some minutes. It remained silent. Slowly, I pulled myself up onto the bank. Without either my glasses or a torch, I knew I had no choice but to stay where I was until morning. Cold, hungry and afraid, my ears strained at every sound, but I slept eventually. I was awakened by the sound of voices calling my name. David! David! I'm here, I called. Here, here by the pool. The shriek of a jay wrenched me back to the present. As I stood there, I thought about how I had been affected by that experience. It had made me reluctant to trust, and so my ability to form close relationships had remained stunted. In my twenties, I had taken refuge in academia, and over time I had carved out a successful career. I retraced my steps, immersed in feelings that had not been in my conscious mind for many years. I was uncertain about whether I should go on to the village. In the event, I decided I would. It was even hotter now. I made my way slowly along the road. After a little while, it rose slightly and veered to the right. The overhanging trees provided some welcome shade. Then out again into the sun's glare, I shaded my eyes. A bit further on, a slurry tanker stood stationary at the side of the road. Two men were shouting at each other as a vast hose that had somehow become disconnected disgorged a thick sludge across the road. Both men were now up to their ankles in it. The stench was appalling. As I drew level with them, the man nearer me looked up. Our eyes met and locked in mutual recognition. It was Bert Hollins, grey-haired now, bloated and paunchy, no longer a source of fear. Nothing was said. I skirted the welling pool of effluent and walked on. <laughs> Good, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that was... Um, it's again, it's a story. It it's, is. It, you know, and it, you, you want to listen, you want to hear more, you want you to do. know what's going on. Yeah. Short, short stories, it's not a book. Mm. You know. no, that, that would make a good, a good film short story. Yeah, to actually see it, yeah. <laughs> Just the whole night of him in the woods, mm. that would be quite mm. such a scary thing to mm. go through. Mm. 
Um, and the revenge. Yes. This could be called the Slurry's Revenge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, on a serious note, though, there's one-off incidents that happen to people when they're young that are, are bully-related can mm. have such an astounding effect mm. on people. It, mm. It's quite frightening, really. Mm. It does fascinate me how one event in somebody's life yes. Yes. can change yeah. everything. Yes. Mm. And I, I write mm. about that. I mm. find mm. that fascinating. Mm. Because that abusers imagine? are very good at making the person they're abusing feeling Absolutely. it's their fault it's their yes. fault mm. yes they are experts in that yeah, yeah. if anyone listens problem. to the archers <laughs> I Helen know. Titchener yes and psychopathic charming husband mm. Rob Oh, that that's a fascinating it study, is isn't it? Yes, it is I haven't listened to that. Oh wow! Well. No, I don't, know. No, right. I don't listen to saga. the archers, but my friend does, yeah. and I have not missed a single episode of that event. Yeah. Very very <laughs> cleverly done. She, oh. Yes, mm. yes. And oh, they are clever people. Mm. Coercive control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, don't worry, we can edit things out. <laughs> <laughs> um. For, for the listen again, we'll just bring it down to the short stories, not to worry. Yeah. Um, no, we're talking about the um, the, the story that you, that you, the, that you just did, yes. Mary. Um, see, I would imagine the guy in that wouldn't say what happened. No. I think he would just say he got lost until obviously parents or guardians mm. coming mm. to find him, would he? Mm. just got lost. He'd probably be frightened mm. of reprisals. Yes. Yes. He yes. might have to go there yes. again. Mm. Yes, well, he did because he went to stay with his grandparents. So, mm. exactly. Mm. Yeah. No, he wouldn't say. No. A lot of the attitude of adults is you should stick up for yourself. Mm. Whatever the circumstances, aren't they? Mm. It's so hard when I mean we we we're watching things on television, dramas, and things where there's a like a sort of bullying, and especially when it's young people, mm. you think what can they actually do? Mm. Because telling the adults and telling the teachers is is what they're advised mm. to do, but then mm. you kind of know from having been that age that that kind mm. of doesn't always work. No, it no. doesn't. No, it's a well, really horrible thing soft, to be. In. Soft line, you know. Mm. As you say, stick up for yourself. Mm. And yeah. who said it? I'll speak to them. And you think, oh no, because then they'll mention my name, no, and then yeah. they'll bully me yes. even more. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And wait for me after school. Yes. And mm. Yeah, you, we all need like a kind of Mr. Miyagi to sort of train us up and make us like strong, powerful. Yes. <laughs> that, that's what they need. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, um, how can you mm-hmm. can't be protect the child? He's got to walk home from school. They could be waiting around the mm. corner for yeah, him. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. And that mm. that fear is terrible. Well, I think mm. modern schooling, from what I gather from my friends' children do tackle these issues they mm. have personal development and things and I think they're far better at it I think they are actually yeah, than become... when I was at school even my grandchildren who are in their 20s now I think um, mm. which yeah. is a good thing it is a good thing things are much more out in the mm. open um, Mary I know you've got a dash must, off haven't you yes yeah. I must go nice John, to see you no no nice to be here and, yeah. and thanks very much yeah, yeah great lovely, absolutely thank wonderful you. and come back and do some more stories soon yeah indeed yes, yes. 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 you come The CBS Show, exploring the nation's second favourite pastime. Go to www.exetercbs.org.uk to find out how you can make a difference in your community. Writing. I know, yeah. D- 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 that there's the discipline and the fun of being given the title, mm. I think. Yeah, we've just been talking about how people write. And there's something you guys mentioned earlier on, I think it was while the music was on, was that you, you'd all put a word into the That's middle right, yeah. and then you have to do a story that's based on whatever the words are. Yeah, but quickly, it's, it's quickly. an exercise where really the pen should not leave the paper. Yes. You yeah. have to actually uh, just keep writing. Yeah. So as it comes up, traffic lights and... And the strange thing is, if you had on that set of like, if, words, if your first word was yoghurt... Mm. the whole story would be totally mm. different to it starting with another word that you pick out of the, the pot yes it, it's yeah. very weird and they are all so different and we really love them don't we it's we such do. fun yeah that, like, that sounds mm. like a fun mm. yeah so giving people an idea really of what they can expect if they mm. come and join the group there's there's fun exercises it's very supportive very um, Liz you said earlier that you've been a member of, of, of writing groups and this is yeah. the best one ever yes it's the most relaxed and it's the most helpful and it's fun because we do the five word exercises exercise well if there's five people mm. sometimes it's seven words mm. um and we do yeah. other do other exercises do other you things. know as well and 
there's not there's never enough time in two hours no no, no. you know to, to do everything and um, perhaps just do a class piece and then to write what uh, to read what people have written over the fortnight you know mm. as well yeah so it's it's all go yeah but I suppose yeah. the main thing is um, most of us aren't racing to publication we're mm. doing it for fun because we enjoy it it's a yeah. way of life for me I get newspaper articles and I make up stories around them just for fun ah. it's, this one came from a newspaper article yeah mm. this story and I love doing that that's a good way of doing yes. it it's interesting. I write in bed by the way <laughs> okay so that's part of your method and you're, and you're the one that plans you, yeah. your stories out yeah and, I, and because once I get up I mean I type them in downstairs you know on the, on, mm-hmm. on the computer but all the thinking all the outlining all that they're written upstairs and I think because once I'm up life just kicks in yes it does yeah and then you you never sure get back to yeah. it I mean you know yes yeah, it's, it's true it's, and very, it's what it's I hot. found the best way for me to mm. do it very yeah. hard what, during the day to it is. stop I'm saying I've got to get into the office I've got to get into the right then something else happens. Then the cats. Then the, then the shopping, and so yeah. on. And you think oh, I didn't do it today. I must do it first thing tomorrow morning. And so you start again on this mm-hmm. roll. And the discipline is very very hard. It is. I mean, a friend of mine who, who comes up with ideas. Yet we haven't got him to write anything down yet. Julian. Um, he um, he always says it's when he's mowing the lawn that he comes up with ideas well, but in, the, in, in the Amazon they've got lawns <laughs> in the Amazon yeah he, yeah, he, he well he's, he's headed off somewhere else now. I think he's last seen around the Dardanelles oh really yeah. oh golly well I always carry paper and pen because you never know when a little idea is going to hit you exactly yeah well, that's with what Julian, you could do. we're waiting they all seem to be little ideas but he's not exactly expanding on them is he and no he gets distracted very he gets easily. distracted yes, yes. Yeah. In the Amazon basin, there yes. was a lot of distraction. He was lucky to get out alive. I think he was, yeah. Lucky I mean, it's not so much the tribes, because I know he knew where they were, but, but it was sort of like crocodiles and, yes. you know, things like that. It's not yeah. as dangerous as it was, but it sounded pretty scary, and, you know, in um, parts, yeah. didn't it, John? It did, yeah. He was around the Ilha de Marajo area, which is quite crocodile to say the least. Um, so let's have, he had more luck in the Dardanelles. <laughs> Let's hope so. We'll hope. Yeah, he, we'll he, see. He might finally end up in Belgium, and he's, then he can start, can't he? Exactly. Yes. yes. In the end, he might. Yeah. Yes, let's, we'll keep our fingers crossed yes. for him. Yeah. We really will. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sort mm. of giving up hope with him, actually, but <laughs> you must never do that. You must never let her... No. And he's a good writer, but he just um, procrastinates, I think is the word. I think he does, yeah. Well, that's why I love being out. retired, because you have got the time you're not trying to fit it in with everything else I mean I share a house with my son who I sort of care for but I am retired and I can plan mm. I don't have to plan my day around work exactly. I mean like Mary's working and mm-hmm. and writing. Charlotte in the group when she was in the yeah. group mm. and she just had to leave because she said she's just too exhausted yeah. at the end of the day and she's then the week leading, the weekend yeah. is just housework yeah. shopping cleaning exactly. getting ready to go back yeah. to work again yeah. Yeah. and she found that uh, that stopping that and it was just too much and she was just getting stressed from it which is a shame mm. but she wrote some nice things Charlotte yes yeah I think when you're retired it's important my sister who unfortunately died last year in Berlin she was a dancer she used to say to me you've got to have a passion in life mm. Mm. and I think that is so true mm. yeah yeah, yeah some, a passion that mm. was her word Liz's sister was um, danced with with Pina, Pina Bausch, Bausch. Oh, she was wow. in a troupe yes and danced oh, yeah. with her fantastic yeah, for ten years she was one of her dancers and then she formed her own company and unfortunately she died last year and she's buried in That's Berlin sad. yeah where, where she, you know where, where her life was yeah 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 Oh wow! Yes, yeah. but that's her words. You've got to have a passion. You have mm. got to have a passion. Yes, yeah. yeah. I did a fascinating study once, and I was doing psychology, and we got money from the lottery, and it was with older people, and one group people just visited them and had a cup of tea with them. The other group they were helped with an old passion, so somebody would go fishing with them or do art with them. And then they compared the general health and well-being on each mm. group, and the passion group did far of better. That's and they actually fund that sort of enterprise now. Absolutely, yes. which, which they brilliant. must do more as well for dementia. Yes, mm. you know, 
Yeah. I think Age UK at the moment, we had, we had a load of, of new opportunities for volunteering with Age UK. And they have buddy systems setting up now where, yeah, that's how people are matched up according mm. to their interests. Yes. And then they do them together. Yeah. So it's a... Uh, it's Mary, Mary works for Age UK. Yes, yeah, she's just gone off to work yes, now, hasn't yes, she? Yes, yeah. exactly. And there's a lot of brilliant stuff that they're doing, mm. which is really good. Liz, should we have your story? Right. So, well, I've done the visit as well, mm-hmm. which we were given to do. It's a little bit different. Hi, Rev. It was Colin from the probation service looking shocked and surprised to see me as he knocked on Cynthia's door, and I was just as surprised to see him. I only knew him from the boys' club I ran for the young lads who needed to mend their ways, and Cynthia didn't seem to be the type to be involved with the probation service. All thoughts of relative went when I saw Colin showing her his identity pass. I'd been the Reverend for over 20 years when Cynthia arrived in the village and after she lived there a couple of months everyone agreed that she was a good soul. I thought Cynthia was familiar to me but then she was the stereotypical older lady, white hair, in her case curly Dylan style, twinkly blue eyes, neat skirts at calf level, often pleated and twin sets with pearls. Everyone felt they had known her forever. She slotted neatly into the place of the just departed Anne. In fact, the slightly forgetful would often call her Anne. Every Sunday, Cynthia came to church, not once but twice, and sat looking raptured during my sermons. I began to think Cynthia had a crush on me an occupational hazard as she was always inviting me to tea but I was a resolute bachelor and would like to point out that I've never looked at the choir boys the next day I went to the boys club and Colin stopped me before I could ask he told me what I already knew his lips were professionally sealed but he did mention newspapers a goodle troll it helped that I knew Colin mainly worked with killers of all description on licence found Cynthia was the black widow she had gone through five husbands and it was only on the last one she had got done for accidental killing got his pills meddled and everyone said she'd done a wonderful job looking after him and accidents do happen and the other four were all natural causes it was touch and go as to whether it was manslaughter so the judge hedging his bets put her on licence with probation I was speechless stunned in my head and being the reverend couldn't tell anybody I wished it was yesterday when my little world was at long last in order now my brain is chaotic I would never trust my judgement of people again but mind you I shouldn't be surprised I too had a past I didn't want churned up i have been a rock star well a rock guard but now I'm following my own rock god, albeit of the spiritual type rather than the hardcore. To look at me now with my dog collar and frock, bald head, squeaky clean both in and out, I challenge anybody to recognise a long, greasy head, foul smelling, foul mouth guilt, dressed in leathers that hardly saw the light of day. Either they were in bed or on a dimly lit stage. They were actually cut off me when my frail, gaunt body finally caved in after years of abuse and my brain conveniently had a Damascus Road conversion and saw the light. I detoxed in the seminary. Nobody knew. They all thought, as the drugs slowly, painfully left my system, it was the Holy Spirit awakening in me, my spiritual birth. My fears of having tea with Cynthia transferred from worrying about my chastity to fearing for my life. She wasn't in mass murderer league, but who knows what she had in mind. And then these fears transferred to everyone, even my housekeeper, and to be safe I dispersed of her services on the pretense that austerity had hit the vicarage. So I lived on takeaways, visited after dark when the elderly village was safely tucked up. But I have to say, I did feel a thrill at this deceit. A thrill I missed, if I was honest, and being good and pious can be exhausting as being on the road. I soon understood at the seminary that thrill-seeking had to be abandoned for the sanctuary of God. In fact, any heightening stimulation of the senses was out. Complete peace of mind and body was the desired objective. Dead boring really sums it up. Then horror of horrors, the realisation that I'd let myself give into temptation, doing nothing to resolve my dilemma except eat takeaways and have a thrill. I should have stopped after the first trip. 
it will never happen again, I told myself firmly. But then I had no food in the house, and hunger made me give way to temptation, so that doesn't count, does it? I was on my final trip to the takeaway that I met Beefy Bronx, my old drummer. Amazingly, he recognised me beneath the dog collar when he heard my voice asking for the usual. He hadn't believed the rumours, thought I was detoxing again. But I could tell him what was going on. Nobody would believe a junk head like him. And he had a solution to my mixed-up brain and obvious distress, a little medicine to take the edge off. This could be the very last temptation not to resist. And, well, one little bit won't do any harm, will it? <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> I'm enjoying the themes in that about like can you really change somebody or can they really change yeah yeah because mm. um, even the, with the bit where about the um, the young lads to mend their ways you kind yeah. of think well they're mending their ways for the sake of being told they've got to mend their ways they're not changing yeah, yeah it's interesting isn't it mm. Well, I, I'm sort of writing this Granny and the Rock Star at the moment, and I've been doing a lot of research by reading about the rock stars' lives of mm. the 60s and 70s. I mean, really interesting. Yeah. And why some of them succumbed to drugs and some didn't, but basically a lot of them stopped just in time. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I, think, I think Charlotte would, would say, being that she's you know, being a yeah. counsellor, that uh, it's all to do with... Um, this can be hereditary addiction mm. and um, there are mm. other reasons why people are pushed into it mm. and unfortunately it gives people a community yeah it's, it's something to connect with, with people yeah and I think what you know if people come off drugs they need to be offered or have another community because mm. you know even though it's, it's people on the you know that live on the streets they've actually got some sort of weird community going well I mean yeah, well, we see that at, um, at the CVS every day now we've yeah. got the, the different people coming in for the homeless outreach team um, and they are a community yeah. and, and, and there is a kind of drink drugs homeless mm. thing going on yeah. with them um, which is such a shame as well it because, is such a shame um, you just want them to be well yeah. mm. to have somewhere to live and to get a little bit back into society if they can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but of course, they—it's where do they? Where can they live? Where are the places for them? And the hostels? There isn't enough. Is there? there isn't enough. No, I mean this is a big problem. Talking to one of the guys who who runs the um, the home salary team, so there just isn't the accommodation for no. people to get them off the streets. No, exactly. It's very hard. Yeah. It must be horrible. I mean, I don't know if anyone can imagine what it would be like with the winter coming. No, exactly. And to have to worry about cardboard boxes and curled up, and mm. we all oh, take horrendous. it for granted that we get up in the morning, just go into the shower, mm. put the kettle on. Imagine, imagine living on the streets. No, exactly. It must it be is. just horrendous. It's horrendous, yeah. Um, and making decisions based on you know, if people are using drink and drugs all the time. You can't really make the decisions you need to make in that situation. You can't. Uh, I interviewed a young woman recently who uh, has been sort of detoxed from alcohol for quite a few months now. And she said that the thing for her was that a doctor spoke to her just at the point when her brain was sober and explained to her about drinking and what it was actually going to do to her. And she's only sort of in her mid-20s. And oh. he said, it won't take that long to do what it's going to do to you if you carry on. Mm. Um, and she said, luckily, uh, my brain was switched on and I was sober at the time and I took it on board. And, um, wow. But she said, if he'd said that to me the day before, when I was drunk, I would have just taken no notice. Yeah. Um, it's really hard, isn't it's it? It's terribly hard. And, you know, some people haven't got the strength to not knowing. They think, oh, I shouldn't really have that bag of crisps. I shouldn't have that bar of chocolate, but oh, hell to it. And they have it. Mm. Imagine what it would be like when you are really ill mm. to say well, no, I'm not going to have that uh, bottle of beer, glass of wine, cider, mm. that uh, heroin, mm. when they are addicted to it. Yeah, so it's the willpower. Yeah, it's, right. it's very hard. It's hard to go on a diet. Mm. I know, it's hard enough just to say no to the biscuits and what off you eat, let alone exactly. to come off like a, a highly well, addictive substance. Black chocolate is my downfall. As long as there's black chocolate in the world, I will not be tense. You know, I will not be size 10. <laughs> Have you tried the 99% stuff? Oh, yes. It's amazing, isn't oh. it? Yeah, yeah. I can only eat a little square of it because it's pretty powerful. Oh, it is really. strong. It is very yeah. strong. Yeah, but I can eat 
Oh, I'm in admiration of you there. It's, it's amazing stuff. It is. Um, oh, but it would be nice to help everybody. But it would, yeah. The stories, by the way, have been absolutely astounding today. Oh, thank you, John. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much. And you, yeah. and thanks CVS as Mm-hmm. Well for all that day. So th- starting back on the 10th of September, Saturday the 10th. Mm-hmm. Yes, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, 10, 10 till 12. 10 yeah. till 12. St Thomas Library. St yeah. Thomas Library. Um, all welcome. They mustn't be put off if they hear the work that uh, some of the group do mm. because that is not all of the group. Yeah. And we are we, we pick out what we feel is the best. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot, lot of different styles and different writing and people who are just have not got to any level yet and yeah. we are there to guide them and help them all they need is the enthusiasm and the longing to do it yes exactly yeah. it's not it's not just going to come from us to them mm. they have their input mm. but we can hone it and help them and it's fun and it, and it is that's fun. what it comes across at, at real good fun yeah and everyone's very supportive of each other yeah. and kind there's no nastiness uh, it's not right, right, right. It's not that kind of pressure, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it's just a very nice atmosphere. Excellent. And the time goes very quickly, and St Thomas Library are wonderful. Yeah, they say yeah, you're really pleased to be there, aren't you? Yes, we are very yeah. pleased to be there. There's, um, they're, they're they're good, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Well, thank you very, very much. It's been thank brilliant you, stuff. Thank you. You've been listening to the CVS show on Phonic FM. The show was produced by John Stammers and Nick Kiss for Exeter CVS. For more information about any of the issues raised in this programme, visit www.exetercvs.org.uk, email cvs at exetercvs.org.uk, call 01392 202055, or visit us weekdays, 9.30 to 4.30 on King William Street. Exeter CVS is a registered charity supporting the community and voluntary sector in Exeter.